Hey y'all, um, now we are going to be talking about fatty acid oxidation, um, specifically beta oxidation. There are other forms of fatty acid oxidation, but we're going to focus only on the fatty, uh, on the beta oxidation um, because that's, that's the most important one that we use in our cells. So for beta oxidation, um, as we are thinking of being um, in need of energy, we, we made the fatty acids when we had a lot of energy, we were in the fed state, but now we have switched over to the non-fed state where we don't have enough energy. So we're going to take our fatty acids, break them down um, through lipolysis um, and beta oxidation where we're going to break them back down eventually into acetyl-CoA and that will be able to be used in the Krebs cycle to make energy. So the first thing that we need to do is think about where those fatty acids are stored which are adipocytes. Um, in the adipocyte there is a protein sitting there it's called perilipin. Um, perilipin is in the fat cell and it binds with the fats, the fatty acids, the triacylglycerides, which is how they're typically stored in the adipocytes. Um, and this perilipin um, is going to prevent the enzymes that break down fats, which are called lipases. It will prevent those lipases from breaking them down. But when you stimulate the cell, it activates a kinase called protein kinase A, and protein kinase A itself is activated by CAMP, which we know is a stimulatory kind of enzyme. And once you activate that perilipin with protein kinase A, it stops protecting the triacylglycerides um, from the lipases, and the lipases are able to start the breaking down process. Um, now, we see that protein kinase A is stimulated by CAMP, but what stimulates the CAMP itself? Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine, so the adrenalines, if you think of the fight or flight response, you need energy quickly, so these two hormones tend to be stimulatory in terms of energy production. Uh, something called glucagon-like peptide. This comes from cells in your intestines called enteroendocrine cells. Entero refers to having a hormonal function, and, or I'm sorry, from, from being in the intestines um, or in the digestive tract, and endocrine has to do obviously with having a hormonal function. So glucagon-like peptide made by these cells when they're not absorbing nutrients helps to break down those fats all the way out in your adipocytes. Um, atrial natriuretic peptide. This stimulates a protein called protein kinase G. Um, protein kinase G can then go on to activate the cell in various ways, which allows the lipases to work. Um, now glucagon, we always think of glucagon as kind of the you know, when you're in the non-fed state, you have glucagon present, you're releasing glucagon, and it's helping to um, release uh, glucose from your cells. But it is not stimulating, well, I shouldn't say that. It may not be stimulating lipolysis quite as much as the glucagon-like peptide does. It might be helping it to do it. Um, the extent to which glucagon actually stimulates lipolysis is kind of under debate. There are some conflicting studies about that one. So it's probably not the main player in that, but it might be of assistance in helping stimulate um, lipolysis. But that's still kind of, you know, something that people are looking at. Okay, now those enzymes, those lipases that break down the fats. Uh, I really, this didn't print out so well. It got a little fuzzy during the printing, but if you can see that, ATGL um, is one enzyme. HSL is another, and then MAGL is the third enzyme that we're going to be talking about. So there's ATGL, there's HSL, and there's MAGL, and they go in that order. So this would be a triglyceride or a triacylglyceride, same 
kind of idea. So, uh, you know, three fatty acid chains here. Um, this would be a diglyceride or a diacyl glycerol. Um, you know, again, same thing. And then there would be a monoglyceride or a monoacyl glycerol. Um, and then finally, just plain old glycerol is the end result along with a um, fatty acid all by itself. So see this little like kind of squiggly line of the fatty acids. There's just one on the monoglyceride, on the diglyceride, there's two, and on the triglyceride, there's three. So we go from, this is our little fat situation with the triglycerides here, with the three, we go from three to two to one to, oh, they're completely broken apart. Okay, so the glycerol is sort of like the backbone with the fatty acids hanging off, if you think of it like that. Um, and these enzymes will go sequentially to break these down. So stored form inside the adipocyte, breaking down, or sorry, breaking this down into, you know, just having two, going from three to two, then going to one, then none. Okay, um, now these then can go into the blood. They are going to first be bound to fatty acid binding proteins um, in the cytoplasm of the adipocyte. And then they will diffuse into the blood um, where they'll be caught up with albumins that are just floating around in the blood. And the albumins are going to act as a transport protein that will take them through the blood and essentially escort them to other cells where you're taking these, you know, essentially stored forms of energy, you know, they're, they're fatty acids, they are ready to be broken down for energy um, into other cells that are in the non-fed state and need them. So now we've taken those um, fatty acids, the glycerol, from the adipocyte, and now it's inside another cell, maybe a muscle cell. Say, like where we ended with our last uh, video, we had the muscle cell using the products of lipolysis in order to create energy. So let's just stay with a muscle cell as our example. Okay, so now we're going to start doing beta oxidation. And beta oxidation is where we prepare the fatty acids to go into the mitochondria. They have to be transported into the mitochondria or intermediary products, I should say, will be transported into the mitochondria and then converted into acetyl-CoA where we can put them right into the Krebs cycle just like we would acetyl-CoA that came from glycolysis and pyruvate. So our fatty acids entering into our muscle cell are going to be worked on by this enzyme. It's called the long chain acyl CoA synthetase. Um, acyl, this is not a typo <laughs> like all the other typos I have. So it's not acetyl CoA, this is acyl CoA. And the difference um, between acetyl CoA and acyl CoA is just a matter of um, certain side groups that are on the molecule. But just always make note whether you're looking at acyl-CoA versus acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle. Acyl-CoA is um, something that's an intermediary product of breaking down our fats to um, eventually give us acetyl-CoA. So anyway, long chain acyl-CoA synthetase is going to break down those fatty acids into something like palm Toil, oh, so that is a typo. Pom there should be an O in there, palmitoyl CoA. Um, so this is something that can go into the mitochondria, but it needs to be transported. It can't just move willy nilly. It has to um, have a protein carrier. And the way that it is carried across the mitochondrial membrane is called the carnitine shuttle. Um, the enzyme or the um, thing that is facilitating this movement across the um, mitochondrial membrane is something called a carnitine or a carnitine pomatoyl. So there's an O in there to transferase. And we can just refer to it as CPT. Um, CPT is the carnitine pomatoyl transferase and it will carry the pomatoyl 
um, across and also act on it to help us get something called carnitine, um, which we will see in a second. Okay, so here is the process. Um, we have our fatty acid. This came from breaking down our triglycerides in our adipocytes. Um, here we see ATP. This is going to use some energy. Um, here it's saying COASH, <laughs> so that is coenzyme A. I am just going to refer to it as coenzyme A. So this is another way that you might see it um, abbreviated. I just prefer to just call it coenzyme A. I think it's easier. So coenzyme A. Um, okay, so those things are required for us to take our fatty acid, use energy, use coenzyme A, and then use that enzyme. We mentioned that. That's that acyl-CoA synthetase, and that will give us fatty acyl-CoA. Um, we're in the cytoplasm out here. Okay, so this is in the mitochondrial matrix all the way in here. So we have the outer mitochondrial membrane here, we have the inner mitochondrial membrane here, and then the intermembrane space between. So we have to get our fatty acyl-CoA through into the matrix so that we can then run the Krebs cycle. And we need to change it a bit. So here, that's our CPT. That's the carnitine palmitoyl transferase. We're going to um, see this twice. So one acting as a carrier and then um, two acting just as an enzyme. Um, but out here, it's going to help us carry our fatty acyl-CoA um, into the intermembrane space. Now, once that's in the intermembrane space, it has to get through the um, inner mitochondrial membrane. So here's where we're going to use something called the carnitine acylcarnitine translocase. This is an antiporter. So the fatty acylcarnitine is going in to the mitochondrial matrix. Meanwhile, something called carnitine is going out of the mitochondrial matrix. Um, so where does this carnitine come from? Hold on to that thought. We're going to get to it very, very soon. But let's keep following our fatty acylcarnitine um, into the matrix. Um, here, coenzyme A, again, is going to react with the fatty acylcarnitine using carnitine palmitoyl transferase, CPT, um, as the enzyme to facilitate the production of carnitine and also just plain old fatty acyl-CoA. So almost like splitting it into two in a way. Now this um, carnitine here, this is what's going to be used as the translocator here or the antiporter um, to allow the fatty acyl-carnitine to move through the carrier into the mitochondrial matrix as the carnitine moves out into the inner mitochondrial membrane. So it, that was why that carnitine was important to do that. Meanwhile, the fatty acyl-CoA is going to be turned into acetyl-CoA, just kind of broken down one step further into the acetyl-CoA, and that goes to our Krebs cycle. Okay, I'm sorry about the little doggy barking in the background. Um, let me get through, we only have another minute here. This looks super complicated. We don't need to look at all the little steps. This is just another type of fat um, being broken down through beta oxidation. And really what we're looking at is step one, two, three, and four. The dog is a little, um, she's a 14 year old Yorkie and she is very insistent when she wants something. Um, so I'll make it quick. I know that's not a fun sound to hear. Um, but anyway, our step one, here's our fatty acid. So I'll just put a fatty acid up here. We're going to dehydrogenate that. Um, in the process, we're taking an electron and we are moving it onto FAD to create FADH2. Let a tiny bit here. So we're already transferring an electron. This can go on to, you know, like, like the regular um, oxidation reduction pathways that we've, we've talked about. So we are creating FADH2 here. Um, then we get into step two. We're just hydrating. We're adding water to our intermediary product 
And then we're going to dehydrogenate again. So here we're taking again an electron um, off of our intermediary product, adding it to NAD where we get NADH. So there we go. We have FAD, um, H2, and we have NADH at this point. Um, now here's where we are getting into what I want to show you most importantly on this slide. Look at the fatty acyl-CoA going into acetyl-CoA. That last step is where we get the detail about that. So step four, here is an acyl-CoA. It's a very specific um, acyl-CoA. Oops, up here, sorry. This is the enzyme that specifically deals with this acyl-CoA. Um, so it's just an example of one sort of acyl-CoA, but we're going to do acylation of that using coenzyme A. So there's that coenzyme A as, as um, you know, something that's facilitating this reaction. There's our acetyl-CoA. So that is the detail right there where we do step four. I'll just put step four here from the next slide. That's that. That's how we go from our fatty acyl-CoA to our acetyl-CoA, and that goes off into the Krebs cycle. Okay, so that is our beta oxidation video. Um, I'll go tend to the dog, and then we will get into our next video, which is the pyruvate malate cycle, which goes back to the beginning of fatty acid synthesis.